Okay, so in this video, we're going to take a look at electron diffraction and how that allows us to directly measure the size of a nucleus. And then we'll go on to look at actually finding an equation that links the nucleon number and the size of the nucleus as well. So let's start where I left off last time, looking at what the current model has before electron diffraction comes along. So the model for estimating nuclear size is the closest distance of approach model, uh, which essentially was looking at at what point do, does the strong force come into play? Oh, that's roughly the size of the nucleus. So it's an approximation. But as I said before, the problem with this is actually that the strong force interrupts it and ruins your results at certain points and prevents you making an accurate measurement. So along comes electron diffraction. So let's just do a quick overview of what diffraction is. You have met this before in year 12. So um, an object is diffracted if it encounters something the same size as its wavelength. So a lot of people have this idea in their head that the only thing that can cause diffraction is a slit or two slits, whatever. That's not true. If you encounter anything the same size as your wavelength, then you're going to be diffracted by it. And for particles, their wavelengths calculated using this equation, which again, you have probably met in year 12. Uh, it can calculate the wavelength of a particle, if you know Planck's constant, its mass and its velocity there. And for most particles, this is a very, very small number, which is why you don't see it happening very much, because they don't encounter objects the right size. However, with electrons, their wavelength is sufficiently big that you can see these diffraction characteristics there. So uh, before you'd have seen with interference what a diffraction grating pattern looks like. So that's, you're essentially going to get the central maximum and then maxima as you go further out. So you get bright and dark fringes pattern. That's kind of what you've seen beforehand. Now electron diffraction as a measuring device is a little bit different to that. So because the diffraction are not just caused by a slit, but they're caused by 3D particles, instead of just a dark light and dark bands, we get light and dark rings here. And typically with electron diffraction, you look at where the first dark ring is, or your first minimum intensity point there. Or you don't have to, you can look at other things, but we'll get to that in a minute. So generally speaking, what you do is you fire your electron beam at whatever you're interested in measuring, and you look at the angle of diffraction to the first minimum intensity there. And just like with the gold foil experiment with alpha scattering, you need a very thin like, slice of it so you don't get multiple scatterings. Um, so that's essentially how this works. Um, in terms of where that equation you can see at the bottom left comes from, let's take a look at that. So this equation was first sort of experimentally determined by looking at the angular size of the central part. So what that means is this here, the width of your central ring or circle if you like, corresponds to this size here. And this here is where you are standing or your detector is to take the measurement. So the angular size is this angle in here. And what they noticed is from the experiment, you could find, you found this relationship here between these variables. So this is an experimentally determined relationship. Okay. So most textbooks you'll read don't talk about this angle, though. What they talk about is the angle to the first minimum. So let's take a look at that. And what you can actually see is that those two are talking about the same thing. So the angular size in here is actually equal to the angle between the zero order and the first minimum here. So essentially those two are talking about the same thing, which is why you end up with exactly the same equation, whichever the two you were talking about there. Um, so either of those two explanations work, but most textbooks typically will talk about this angle in here. Um, that's why. Okay, so that's how you can go about measuring the actual size of the nucleus. So once you've done that, it gives you the ability to measure the size of lots of different things. So what they wanted to do is work out if there was an equation that linked the number of nucleons a nucleus had and the size of the nucleus, because that would be an interesting thing to find out. So what they did is they assumed it was this kind of relationship here, so the size or the radius 
of a nucleus, imagining that it's a sphere, is some sort of constant multiplied by the number of nucleons to the power n. So they didn't think it would be a linear one, although they allowed for the fact it could not be linear here. And if you want to find uh, these two things, what you need is a log-log graph. So that's what you can see here. You've got log of the nuclear radius and log of the nucleon number. And what you can see is this comes out as a straight line with a gradient of a third, which tells you that A is raised to the power of a third. And we also get a y-intercept, which gives you this R0 term here. So you can find out both parts of the equation from the log graph there. So what you typically see in textbooks and kind of things is actually this graph, where you plot the radius against the nuclear number to the power of a third, because that will give you a straight line graph uh, because you can see here, the radius is directly proportional to a to the third there. And that's what you can see, a straight line graph going through the origin. But in this case, the gradient would be r0. So that's the graph you'd usually see, uh, but this is the graph where those values actually come from. Um, so if you plug in a equals 1 into this equation, you can see that r equals r0, which means r0 must be the size, the radius of a hydrogen nucleus there. So typically you'll see values about 1.4 times 10 to the minus 15, so in the femtometer kind of range, but you see different values the, if you google it, look in a textbook, you'll see loads of different values. There's not one established value. Well, I mean there is, but for some reason the textbooks haven't agreed one, but it won't matter particularly to your working with this. Okay, so the last thing we can look at is essentially how this relates to nuclear density. So if we assume that all nucleons have the same mass, and they're the same kind of size, so they have the same volume, we know that all the nucleons will have the same density. And if we assume that the separation between the nucleons is consistent, uh, we should expect it to be, because they're all acted on by the same strong force, then what you can end up with is that concluding that nuclear density is in fact constant. So every nucleus has the same density there. Um, which means a neutron star has a similar kind of density, and we'll see the values in a second. So generally speaking, if we want to calculate density, we divide mass by the volume. And if we assume that the nucleus is a sphere shape, which seems fairly reasonable, we can end up with this equation here once we substitute in the equation from the previous slide there. So if we're doing the radius cubed, we end up with R0 cubed times A there. So if we try it for a few different atoms, let's see what comes out. So we've got it here for carbon, we've got for gold, and we've got for any generic element with A nucleons. We can see that every time the nucleon number is going to cancel out, because on the top line you need it for essentially saying how many nucleons you've got, how much, how much the mass is, and at the bottom you need it for um, identifying the... like this one here, the A in the equation. So that always cancels out. So you can see we end up with the same density every time. And you can see we end up with the same colossal number, the 10 to the power of 17 um, kilograms per meter cubed. That is an incredible amount of mass in a very, very, very small space, which is what we'd expect, because we know that's where the mass is concentrated, but that's an incredibly huge number. And to think that neutron stars are this density gives you an idea of just how dense they are. Okay, so that concludes looking at measuring nuclear size. Um, I hope you found these video, this one and the alpha scattering video useful for this topic.